Okay, folks, good morning, and welcome to Toronans and Friendly Skies. We have here the P1101. You guys have seen it before on videos, but I got some information. I've been digging around trying to find something on the aircraft, and I finally did. Um, on its predecessor, I found some basic information, but nothing terribly Interesting, and then I stumbled across this site right here. And it runs all the way through the various uh, itinerations. There were three of them. As you can see here, this is the original aircraft with uh, ducks very far forward on the side. Didn't survive that way very long. It was redesigned to be a little sleeker and more aerodynamic. And these fed a single um, engine buried in the fuselage. And you notice they're using the boom and uh, pod design even still. And then we have the third design, which is what you see in World of Warplanes. And you'll notice that this is awfully, you know, it's still the boom and pod, but... Um, they buried the engine in here, the duct is straight through, everything you would see on the MiG-15, you would see on the F-86, it's all there. Now, this aircraft actually existed in a, in a prototype form, was being built and awaiting the engine. Um, where it was, it was being designed in an area of southern Germany, uh, Bavaria to be exact, and the site had never been discovered, so it was never bombed. Uh, but putting an aircraft together in late war Germany was tough to say the least. The country was being bombed. Uh, by the time this happened, major portions of the country had been overrun. You know, just going down the road in a car could be hazardous to your health since P-51s were constantly sweeping overhead and were known to strafe anybody <clears throat> and anything, civilian or not. Uh, if you guys saw my P-51 video and I said there's no such thing as a good war, well, that applies to America just as much as any other country. Uh, German civilians knew not to ever gather on a train uh, landing until the very last minute because if a P-51 showed up, it would strafe the civilians at the UL yard, at the rail station. And it's just the way it's war. And wars are ugly and vicious and cruel, and I'm sorry. But uh, if anybody ever wants to talk to me about a good war, it would be very hard for me not to cough and laugh on the way out, uh, turning my back on them. Okay, um, in any case, we had, uh, this is the plane. So they had the, uh, we're building the plane in, in uh, Bavaria when U.S. troops arrived, and they had a couple of days warning, so what they did was they uh, towed the plane into a nearby cave, and then they micro-filmed uh, all the documents, and Stuffed them in other caves. And at that point, a uh, couple of days later, the U.S. Army arrived. And proceeded to go rifling through everything, and they had experts come in. And at some point, the French uh, troops arrived and took most of the documents. <laughs> uh, found them in other caves. <laughs> took them back to France. And so the Americans were with the uh, aircraft here uh, in the final stages of construction. It was then uh, packed up on a freight car. It was left outside in the elements for a good long time and then eventually packed up in a freight car. It was already deteriorating from being exposed to the weather. Remember, not even all the panels were finished on this thing, so it was not exactly weatherproof. And at that point, they uh, put it on a freight car. It fell off the freight car <laughs> and damaged it too much for repair. And they actually, uh, over it, uh, they wanted to repair it and trial it, and 
because all the documentation was uh, missing, they, excuse me there, just had, I don't know if you've ever worn head on phones that had a heck of an ear itch, but I just did. The, um, the French actually had the documentation, the U.S. requested it, and they said, hell no. <laughs> Uh, uh, I understand eventually they let them go, but it took a long time. Um, France was desperate to regain its state, uh, stature as a major power at that time. And uh, was, I think the word is obstiferous. You'll have to look that one up. But in any case... They're, they didn't mind telling the U.S. no, despite the fact that uh, Lend-Lease and all the things we were doing to try to help the country. It was uh, kind of a strange situation. The, um, so there begins and ends the tale of the P-1101. Uh, the estimated speed of this aircraft was 621 miles an hour. Now... Anytime you see a prototype plane, you have to understand that it's all gloss and glory. There's no such thing as tail flutter. There's no such thing as wing flutter. There's no such thing as area on, uh, on uh, reversal. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, uh, vibrational stress. There's no such thing as uh, bad stall characteristics, all of which reveal themselves when you're actually building and testing the aircraft. Um, and if all that sounds bad, and it mostly is the development history of almost every uh, aircraft done until the 1970s when you got computer programs that could really accurately predict flight char characteristics. And even still, development aircraft are dangerous aircraft to fly. Um, I remember the uh, picture back in the mid-80s when a, a Swedish Gripen uh, came in and a software error had it uh, flipping sideways and bouncing off of its, uh, its wing. And that wing was so stiff and so tough that it literally bounced like a pogo stick off that wing without crushing the wing. Just amazing uh, uh, engineering. And then proceeded to, you know, total itself. The pilot walked away un uninjured, by the way. Uh, he ejected before that event happened, thank God. And so there we are. So when you see the... Oh, by the way, on development of aircraft, it is not unusual for aircraft to come in, you know, much slower than they're predicted to be. So... When you see these uh, projects that never took to the air, there's no telling what they really would have done. Okay, so there we have the 1101. Um, it is outfitted with four notional uh, 213Cs, and these were the, the Mauser revolver cannon, the one that the U.S., the Soviets, the Swiss, the Swedes, the French, and the British, and I believe the Germans, or the Russians, yeah, the Russians had it too. Um, it got all over the place. And none of those countries had this amazing cannon ready for actual showtime in less than six years. Okay, they first made their, you know, the war ended in April of 1945. The U.S. Uh, was the first to actually deploy them in 1952, I believe is correct. Uh, you check me on that if I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, but they were, uh, it was the E model, so they'd been out for a while. They were still perfecting it. And the reason it was an E model was that making a link, disintegrating link, uh, belt on these was at the very edge of what could be done with modern metallurgy at the time. And it's not alone in that, gentlemen. The uh, M61 had similar problems. 
uh, eventually they had to come up with a D-linker that took the ammunition belt and took the links off of them and then individually fed them in a uh, chamber uh, through a spiral wound uh, mechanical device called a D-linker that sits in front of the feed mechanism and then feeds the rounds into the uh, chamber <laughs> for the Gatling gun. It got so difficult that after this, the uh, they worked on Project Vulcan for two or three years and before they finally get, said links will not work with this uh, type of uh, cannon it just moves too fast and the links can't handle the strain and it turned out to be insurmountable. Well, you're running into this early with this aircraft and it took um, the University of Pennsylvania, I think, was the research uh, uh, arm that was doing it, and the government, and to this day, by the way, it's still going on. Universities have uh, defense programs out there that uh, they they do research and development on, and their graduate students work with along with their professors. And it turns out to be a wonderful way to learn about uh, mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering and all the stuff, material engineering. Um, all of our radars developed during World War II were not developed in in-house by corporations they were done by MIT and Caltech and so forth and so on um, and then turned over to corporations to produce and then that was the beginning of it in World War II uh, but anyway they were looking at it and then they had to be um, slow motion cameras and thermal and metallurgical tests and everything else to say this is the exact angle that the feed belt the, that the links need to work in the feed belt and this is the exact uh, spring hardness elasticity all the tests that you do on uh, metals for this to work and then they had to fill the bottom of the uh, revolver chamber with antifreeze so that it wouldn't overheat and then the <laughs> And they had to use antifreeze because you use water at uh, 30,000 feet. It was freeze solid, of course. And so you get the idea of all the things it took. And then, of course, the sealing mechanism and something moving at 1,500 to 1,700 RPM. Uh, rounds per minute, by the way, not uh, revolutions per minute. Um, you can imagine how tough that was um, to figure out. So just because you had a Mauser, I, I see that over and over when I go through the documentation, you look at the Mauser 213C and they talk about, and if they deployed, the, had time to deploy this, well, they were half a decade from deploying it. You know, uh, the Orca Line Company is no slouch. The uh, Bofors Company is no slouch. Uh, you know, G General Electric is no slouch. Colt is no slouch in designing firearms. Uh, the British uh, and the French were both working on it. We had, you know, literally centuries of uh, firearm development history. The Russians were working on it. You think the Russians can't design firearms? They had uh, straight uh, gas piston operated cannon that were doing 1,100 uh, rounds per minute. You know, so you get an idea. All right. The main problem with this aircraft was it was waiting on a Hankel um, engine that was never be developed before the end of the war. And so they finally stuck a uh, Junkers uh, Humo engine in it. Uh, I believe it was a 003. It might have been a 004. We were going to start testing on it. And the Allies overran it. And the war was over. And that was it. So there is your history of the P-1101. We'll move on to uh, flight with this in just a minute. All right, so we have our P-1101, and let me welcome you once again to Tyronin's World of Warplanes to fly in the unfriendly skies. Go. 
Now the bots have gotten awfully fun of late uh, with the upcoming We're about six hours away from the Summer Storm Special they're running. So I do not dive first into uh, battle with the air defense bots anymore. Takes me a while, but I do learn. I notice even the air defense, the uh, AA defenses are getting tough. I got a chunk of them that time, didn't I? Maybe it's just me, but I am getting the impression that these guys are getting a good deal tougher. The command center is ours. Establishing communication with the main headquarters. So you want to take the flaps off since he's in the run. I don't think that guy can outrun me. And he could. All right. So as the uh, aircraft is portrayed in the game, and I do mention portrayed because it never got out of the prototype stage, the P-1101 uh, is a high-altitude Fighter with a pair of notional guns. Prototype fighter with prototype guns. Probably fitting. Now I have no intention of getting in your line of sight with those 1200 DPS cannons you man mount. Okay. Uh, you notice I scoot very quickly behind his uh, guns. And I'm in no hurry to approach him until I've got enough separation to uh, attack his sides. This 162 is a turn and burn par excellence, but he is way, way over his uh, altitude capabilities, which I find very interesting. Just because you can get up there doesn't mean you should be up there. Now he's very, very turny. He wants to be on my tail, and he's outside of his uh, performance envelope, to say the least. And now, so am I. The 
that's interesting. You should not be able to cling to even. I wanted a clean shot at it, I've got him. All right. And I want the high, highest fighters I can find. Deal what's behind me here, but I know I don't like this. Okay. Oh. User joined your channel. And we are going in the final dive here, trying to get away from everybody and his brother. KI-162-3 and he was upset yeah I can't say I blame him too much but we need to get a couple more out of this before we uh... oh boy Okay, so we have a let's fight of bombers. And I am leaning on the uh, air brake the whole time here to avoid overrunning the aircraft. And that was a clean sweep. see what we can do here to help things along we're down to the point where we're going to have to kill all the aircraft I'm going to get back over the airfield because we've got to get fighters that are actually worth something. And we have bombers coming in. Alright, well my job's kind of laid out for me, isn't it? Ever evolving priorities. I like having to shoot through
Okay, they've done their bit. I need to find out where this last aircraft is at. And I'm heading towards them now, and they're full boost. Actually, I'm trying to make sure my flaps are not extended. There we go. And we are looking for the last fighter here. And there he is. Darn it. Literally had him in my sights, people. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, the endless hopes of fighter pilots and puppies always looking for the next meal. This, uh, the win I was hoping for, but it was a darn good outing. 13 aircraft shot down, assisted uh, with two more. And it was destroyed once. I And this is the engine I was talking about, the Hankel uh, um, S011. Was the aircraft that the uh, P1101 was waiting for to test with? You may remember that from the earlier section. Ventori in the F86 did a great job, and I saw him over that airfield endlessly try, uh, defending it. So hats off to him. And I think everybody else was a bot. If I missed you, I'm sorry. Okay, so that is going to wrap this one up. Hope you enjoyed the video and the instructional <laughs> or educational portion at the front. Hope it wasn't instructional. And uh, let me know if you want to know anything else about this aircraft. I am still reading up on it, but it was, uh, it was a nice eye-opener. All right, folks. Thank you very much. Remember to subscribe, to like the video, and if you want to uh, contribute, uh, you can find the Patreon link on the About page in the uh, uh, on the channel page. So thank you very much.